particularly when Dirk Hasse came as postdoc to Tübingen for the graduate colleague Ars und Scientia in uh, the Middle Ages and early modern period. And uh, we discussed uh, together questions of periodization, also of linguistic crossover. So we ran together on travel literature in Latin and German literature. And there is one volume on von Breidenbach, Peregrinatio in Terram Sancta. Uh, we tried to remember whether we had discussed it. If not that uh, particular book, something um, similar. There are more books on Europe uh, in the cabinet behind us, which we can explore perhaps after um, the talk. And then our travel journeys took us in, in different uh, directions, but in contact partly through the pandemic really learning uh, and uh, finding how fruitful it really is to this and then um when i traveled for the first time now back uh, to germany i had a terrible delay at frankfurt main station so i spent an hour in the um, bookshop there and uh, was uh, quite taken by surprise of seeing a, a new published, uh, featured this um, Dark Nikolaus Hasse, was ist europäisch zur Überwindung kolonialer und romantischer Denkform. So this is Reklam, which is the equivalent of OUB's very short introduction things. And as it happened uh, about a week later, Dark called me and said, I'm trying to okay, a topic about me. About it. I said, yes, please, can you expand on what you've uh, written in this booklet? So that's how, how this talk uh, came about. And over to you, Dark. Thank you very much. That's well, it's wonderful to be here and to, to see you all, also those who are uh, back home. And um, thank you for for being for hosting me <laughs> and uh yeah it was a seminar on i think oriental motives in in, in medieval literature mm. we did together but we, since we don't recall exactly what we, we read <laughs> we, we shouldn't talk too much about it um yeah there are there, there two reasons that i started to to uh to think and and about writing such a small book, like a long essay, really, of 100 pages about what is European. And one is that for for my own research, I never, I, I realized I wasn't quite sure how to use the term Europe. So, for instance, when I, I did some work on Averroes, on Ibn Rushd, uh, the um, uh, Arabic philosopher of Cordoba, and his influence in Europe. So what but what, was, what does Europe mean in, in this context? Um, Cordoba is in Europe, uh, is, is on the European continent, and I was not thinking of, of uh, studying his influence in his own city, but in Latin Europe. And I realized in some of my publications I have been rather imprecise um, uh, on this point. And the other the other reason is that I was not I, I'm getting impatient with the usage of Europe and European in in political discourses of our time. So defending Europe, uh, Christian Europe against um, Islamic influences, or um, if 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 there are immigrants coming to France, that they need to learn uh, the Enlightenment and and how to how to differentiate between and to keep apart um, a reason and um, religion or yeah to, uh, to to learn this and I, I, I and with these concepts basically I I try to engage and I was feeling unhappy with as a historian of philosophy and the sciences or as a general historian with these um, with these usages and that's the book um and the 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 topics are decolonization de-romanticization and then uh, these are basically historical um chapters i would 
briefly like to uh, introduce you to. And then I ask what is typically European? Is there, uh, is there a sensible way in which we can answer the question? And should we perhaps drop the term altogether because it's, it's so loaded with, um, with uh, cultural concepts that we can't really control? Um, and then I have something um, for the educated public, basically, which I try to in the, in the last chapter to, to look at multi-ethnic cities in Europe and describe what I see there as a historian and without um, idealizing these cities, how to um, learn something from it. Um, now, there are some senses in which, I mean, post-colonialism, of course, is a very uh, topic that we all confronted with and perhaps engage in. But um, what I mean here is that I, uh, take issue with two um, two concepts of of what Europe is, um, and one I think comes really from the Enlightenment period, Europe as the continent of reason and enlightenment, and one comes from the period of Romanticism, so around 1800, um, and it's um, a, uh, yeah a combination of Christian and Greek and Latin ideals that are fused in this romantic um, concept of Europe. And, but I should start with a, a view of, of the geographical concept. Of course, if we talk about Europe, we could refer to Europe as sometimes we, we mean the European Union simply by referring to Europe, or we uh, have a political concept, the idea of Europe as a political Union that and that's well researched in uh, the, the 17th century. Is there a problem with the slide? Yeah, no, I'm just uh, thinking it's it's not really moving the slides for you. Uh, it's not moving. Um, it's moving for you. Good. It's moving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Just, so, so try to not to follow me too closely, but to, to have the, the words resonate in your head, and then you five minutes later you see the picture. And then, so you, you can move the slides slightly ahead of your. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that was difficult. It's like an organist uh, playing with the Spanish trumpet at the end of Saint James's uh, of uh, Saint Paul's Cathedral. I have to always uh, yes. play them play them a few seconds before their sound. Yeah. <laughs> or, or yeah, in some orchestra and some opera houses too. Huh? Uh, so, but with this, yeah, there's of course the geographical concept of Europe, which is quite stable if we com compared to cultural concepts um, in in Latin and Greek sources of antiquity and the Middle Ages, the um, Gibraltar, the Mediterranean, um, the Dardanelles and the Bosporus, and then the Sea of Azov and the Don, and in some sources ancient sources, we have alternative rivers in the east, but this is the concept that geographically was also transmitted into, into the Middle Ages, as many of you know very well. And then in the um, the Ural um, uh, Mountains and the Ural River as a border really was popularized in the 8th century by a a Russian Enlightenment thinker, and um, the other the other proposals how to divide the Eurasian um, area, but this is the one that most of us still learn in school uh, around the world. And um, of course, geographical concepts are discourses too. They are not they are not um, not stable in the sense that they are fixed by something real, but they are much more stable uh, than cultural concepts, as we will see. So if we take a, a plane and um, the, the, the pilot says, OK, I will I will land on the European. We really hope that he's not using a cultural concept and they are very 
they are we rely on them because they are so very old as many geographical names they work uh, very well and that's different with cultural concepts of europe and with this we come to the first um concept um which i think really comes up in the enlightenment period and here i have a quote from a from a austrian author robert menasse who's uh, who who wrote europe is the continent that gave birth to a hope of reason every person who thinks and acts in the spirit of the enlightenment is a european person he he says something it's not exactly his 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 uh, to be fair i mean he's not exactly his his words he's, he spoke about european writers and authors um but it's it's a it's a cultural concept so you you can live you can if you if you if you embody the spirit of enlightenment you can live in south korea and you are european and um that's a very um i think it's an, it, it's it's linked to the enlightenment and let's have a look at how it started um when when we at first at first glance it it look it looks very nice but um what do we what do, what, what do we mean with uh, hope of reason if, if it's only um an appeal to critical thinking it's uh it's it would be very arrogant to say because we have critical thinking also in the kantian understanding in very many, many different phases in history we have skeptics we have um people criticizing religious authorities um for instance in india in various phases um or um, we have skeptical reasoning. And even if we think of educational reforms or um, uh, uh, yeah, educational reforms, they are also in different different phases, or even uh, the distinction between state and religion is something that's not refined to the Enlightenment period. We could say much more about this, but I think it's it's very difficult to to maintain this without being without um, ignoring what what's happening in different parts of the world and mm, in fact this cultural a cultural concept of Europe is rises rather late in history and as medievalists we know that um, often in 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 public um, talks for instance for the Karls Prize in Aachen uh, Charles Manje is referred to as the Pater Europae, and uh, Pius II, Piccolomini, the Pope, is uh, referred to as the first who used the term European or Europei. But these two quotations are very uh, singular, um, as, for instance, Oshima, Klaus Oshima has shown in a big book on the concept of Europe in the Middle Ages. It's very, very rare that you get something like a, a the address to Charlemagne as a part of a father of Europe, or which would be a cultural concept, really, not a geographical concept, um, that you get that repeated. And it's, it really becomes popular only such a cult cultural concept around 1700. And there's a very nice study by Malcolm Yap of, of London, um, where he shows that in the instruction for the ambassadeur, in, uh, of France in Istanbul, in Constantinople. And we have a nice, in fact, in this exhibition, there's a nice uh, nice book where you can see the, the France ambassador, the French ambassador at uh, in, in Istanbul, in Constantinople. And yeah, as you can see here on this, on this slide, um, until the late decades of the 17th century, the, you, would, you would speak of chrétienté, but the, this very term was then replaced by l'Europe in subsequent documents. And and he could, he could look at other documents too in the time you get a, it becomes popular to speak of Europe, but what you mean is only the Christian states of Europe. And um, of course, this, this was by Dennis Hayes and others was shown that this has a longer story in uh, elitist, discourse basically before that in the 17th and 18th uh, in the 16th 17th century but that you get 
that lots of people refer to Europe as as basically the Christian states around 1700. And yeah, um, the, the the problem now is if if you do this, um, who belongs to Europe? Is it geographically Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, is is in Europe? It was always on the European side, the Asiatic side of uh, Constantinople was um, yet get settlements only later uh, in the later 18th century. So you, um, you 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 have to ask the question: Does Russia belong to Europe? Does the Orthodox part of Europe belong to Europe? Do the um, do the Ottomans belong to Europe? And you can see that in the 18th century, these the geographical concept and this cultural concept are struggling, and um, and they're not authors like Voltaire or Montaigne. They don't agree on whether. Uh, which part of Eastern Europe belongs to this cultural concept of Europe. And a nice quotation here from Zietler, the most um, um, popular German uh, general educative uh, lexicon, shows that um, this comes into uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, is is distributed in the discourse, in the general educated discourse. All the Europe, he says, is the smallest of all four parts of the world. It is nevertheless preferable to all the others for various reasons. The air is and countryside has an abundance of all the necessary means of life. The inhabitants are very good manner, which is good to hear, <laughs> polite and ingenious in sciences and crafts, sinnreich in Wissenschaft und Handwerken. The Europeans have also brought the most excellent parts of the world under their rule through their skill and bravery. Die vortrefflichsten Teile der Welt unter sich gebracht. And that's exactly the the goes into play. Uh, very similar quotations you could have from Samuel Purchas uh, in in the pilgrimages. Um, so the the voyages of the pilgrims, where he describes the um, yeah, the colonial successes, basically, um, and the, the 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 travels, where he says Europe is the uh, the, the um, in all respects the most uh, eminent part of the world, and that's why we have brought every the, the the rest under our rule, and this is new. I mean, for 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 like for us medievalists, it's, it's clear that Asia must be the first. Uh, the best part of the world, because Jerusalem is in Asia, the earthly paradise is in Asia, and um, yeah, we could talk long about this, but it's the colonial experience basically has turned this upside down, and the experience of being successful, also military terms, um, over the rest of the world. Um, yeah, who belongs uh, is now the question. Um, this is the price for using a cultural concept rather than a geographical concept. And I think, st still think it's the price today. Um, and the original concept of the, the small booklet was to, to, to present a collection of quotations of people who are usually on Europe, quotations on Europe that we usually don't read. And But then I realized even the lector of Reklam Verlag didn't understand what I wanted to show. <laughs> it was too subtle, basically. So that's why I then decided, okay, I need to call it de-romantization and decolonization. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of these, we don't hear the voices of other Europeans in this period. And here I have quotations, perhaps you, you can see them in a few minutes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> perhaps already now. Uh, one is by Al-Hajari, 17th century. He's a Spanish Muslim um, who fled um, the programs against Muslims in the early 17th century. Um, and he writes in Arabic, in this part of the world, in Europe, lies the vast city known throughout the world to be the greatest of all cities, Constantinople, where he goes to Tania. And another quote is from Moses Kunitzer, who was a rabbi in Budapest. And he writes on, on the Sephardi prayer language, 
uh, and he describes where it is used and he recommends it as part of the liberal movement of um, Jewish studies in the 19th century. And he says it's used in face and so on, but also by in Europe, in the cities of Turkey and Italy. And so he's, he refers to Thessaloniki, Saloniki, for example, or, or Edirne or Constantinople. And I've already quoted Tatishchev. So these for these quotations come basically from Budapest, from Constantinople, from Orenburg, where Tatishchev worked on the Ural River. And they're talking about cultural centers of Europe that for some of the French and German writers of the period don't belong to Europe anymore. They had belonged to Europe for a long time geographically, but uh, not culturally anymore for for, um, for for some of the uh, Middle Western European authors. Okay, that is why I think we need to be aware of of our language. If we use an Enlightenment language, like with very nice, I mean, very, I mean, very good intention, we are in danger of um, uh, using an ex excluding an exclusive kind of concept. Now, the second part on de-romanization really is about, um, um, is more medieval, basically, <laughs> um, which is good for this audience. Um, and I start with a very nice quotation in German, in fact, by Theodor Heuss, who was the um, first president of uh, West Germany after the war. Um, there are three hills from which the Abendland Abendland was a very, if you translate it as Occident, it doesn't really capture it because it would be the West too. Abendland is a very German term. It was very, very popular after the war to, to basically in this moral, uh, try to rescue morally the Europe basically, um, in which the Abendland took its starting point, Golgatha, the Acropolis in Athens and the capital in Rome. From all of them, the Abendland is spiritually wrought, geistig gewirkt, and one may see all Three, one must see them as a unity. This this quotation you you can see often quoted in in, in speeches on Europe, but there are others who've taken up this uh, this uh, metaphor basically and say Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome are like foundational cities for what you could describe as the idea an idea of Europe, and this is. A very, um, I can in, in the history books of my 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 children, you, you can see this. It starts with basically Acropolis. If if you have this chapter on Europe, and you get um, the Roman law, and then Christianity, and this, this concept, this combination of Christian belief and Greek and Roman um, thinking, is basically the essence of Europe for. Um, that's a different kind of concept. And I, I argue that it, um, will show you later, originated in around 1800 with Romantic writers. Now, I, I, it, but it doesn't accord with, as I see it, with um, the state of research we have on, for instance, on the Greeks. Um, does it all begin with the Greeks, um, especially Greek thinking, rationality, and no, I mean, the, the, the standard scenario we now have, I think, uh, on, on how uh, Greek sciences um, started is by, by massive imports from Egypt and Mesopotamia. That's, of course, something the Greeks knew themselves. And, but it's not what we find in the school books, really. Um, I don't know about English school books, but it's it's not and it's not part of the general discourse. And um, with Walter Burkhardt, for instance, the um, the Zurich uh, classical scholar, he's he's written very, very influential book books on this um, thesis on the migrant craftsmen that migrant craftsmen are really the who brought the sciences and also elementary demo democratic practices from the East to Greece, especially in the 9th to 7th century BC. So experts on vases, experts on 
um, uh, administration on temple architecture, experts on medicine, on geometry, on the stars, and so on. Sometimes in families, sometimes in guilds, organized. But when I speak about this, people say, well, these were all priests. Yeah. So the Greeks were the first, were not priests, but scientists really studied the science as well. It's, it, that's a cliche. They, um, it's not as easy as that. Um, and even if, if it was, I mean, often these were families who were expert families, um, these migrant craftsmen. And um, even if we look at the Babylonian, um, the Babylonian records of star observation, 600 years of very meticulous star observation, it doesn't really matter if it's priests or not. It's, uh, it's systematic. It's uh, what you have is um, uh, the um, hypotheses uh, in, in science, scientific hypotheses. You have uh, systematic reckoning. Um, so very basic uh, techniques of rationality that are then imported into Greece. Now, that's not, that's to understand what, what or for instance, recipes in medicine um, comes from, uh, and uh, pharmacology comes from um, Mesopotamia and Egypt. And then Theophrast and Dioscorides develop it. Um, what we have, of course, then is very impressive. We have with the Greeks something like a, a second level of theoretical theories. Yeah, second level of theoretization, is that a term? <laughs> um, but yeah, let's move on to um, the to to medieval times, but and before that to the question how we whether we can call Rome and Greece European cultures. They really are Mediterranean coastal cultures, and they're European and Asian and African at the same time, and I have a You've seen two of the maps in the, the small book. This is the second map. And it's, um, perhaps you can see it already. Yeah, there it comes. Uh, it's, uh, so <coughs> it's it's those UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are North Africa, Roman and Greek, in North Africa and West Asia. It's 24 at the moment. That's very, it's all heritage sites. So it's not Alexandria. Or Jerusalem in it, but it's it's a very important sites, and you can, if you inform yourself about vases and and um, tri triumph arcs and statues of the Greeks and the Romans, you can you can for years without ever entering Europe, and yeah, that's. To to uh, that's to demonstrate this. Okay, and I have a, at least one slide on Ptolemy because I, I'm also a Ptolemy scholar. Um, you could argue Europe is so um, uh, is is so Greek and Roman because the reception of Greek and uh, culture was so intense in Europe, but that's true for other parts of the world too. If we have a, even in China, we have a whole Ptolemaic uh, astronomy built, uh, second institute next to the Institute of Chinese Astronomy, you have a full institute with about 40 scientists on Ptolemaic astronomy, um, just to have a, to counter this. Sorry. Wants to, to enter. Yeah. Open yeah. to additional yeah. listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then the um, quotation from Novalis, who is a romantic um, poet, uh, German poet. Those were beautiful, brilliant times when Europe was a Christian land, when one Christendom inhabited this humanely shaped part of the world. A great communal interest united the remotest provinces of this vast spiritual empire. Wo Europa ein christliches Land war. Um, that's, that's a dream, basically. And a dream of united Christian 
before the French Revolution, before the Reformation. And it's, it's a view that you, in fact, that is, yeah. And, and the same you find here in England by Chateaubriand at the very same years in London, in, in the London exile, uh, the French romantic. His, um, it is indeed highly glorious to the church, that's a quotation, that a pope should have given his name to the age. And from among the ruins of Athens and Rome, borrowed Islam from the age of Alexander to reflect it, the saint King of France. And uh, Chateaubriand goes on, therefore generally admitted that to the Holy See, Europe owes part of her best laws and almost all her arts and sciences. Well, this is obviously overestimating the Pope a lot. Um, um, all the best laws, all her arts and almost all her arts and sciences. But this was um, a dream, basically. It was a romantic dream of um, of the chivalry of um, a different time where there was no persecution of um, religion um, as to, to his time. And in, in this previous, how he connected Louis uh, the, with France, um, Rome and Greece. So in a sense, we have here, I think, more or less for the first time, this combination of uh, and romantic and it's not now I'm 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 bringing uh, owls to Athens. It's not one of in medieval sources. Even the understanding, for instance, of Latin clerics, and have here quotation from Adam of Bodimen in the Gesta Hammerburgensis Ecclesia Pontificum, and he praises. Volin or Yumne at the mouth of the river Oder as the largest of all cities that Europe includes. Uh, maxima omnium quas Europa clouded civitatum. Slavs live in it together with other nations, Greeks and barbarians. And um, this later becomes Veneta in, in legends, the, the sunken city. But it's quite clear that this was, in fact, really was a, a big merchant hub and where you have many, many different um, um, ethnical groups on, 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 the, on the streets. And Adam of Bremen was admired the city and he hadn't been there, but he had spoken to Danish uh, merchants and he said it's, it's really their, their very, um, their customs and their, their, their morals are fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, they are, they are not Christian yet. But that that should change eventually. But it's not such a quotation is is exact. Uh, doesn't fit with this romantic ideal of one Christian country in the Middle Ages. And um, of course, the Orthodox doesn't fit into this uh, this concept of Europe either. And Here's a nice quotation from the Emperor Constantine uh, Porphyrogenitos of the 10th century. It is right to place Byzantium, now Constantinople, at the very beginning of Europe. This is um, Arche, because it is an imperial ruling city, towering over the whole world as the heiress of the name of Emperor Constantine the Great. At the head, beginning of Europe, Arche and Untes has replaced the emperors of cities and of the whole world, the new Rome. So this again is a praise of Constantinople. And of course, it's it's a praise in face of what happened with Charlemagne, with the uh, transfer of Rome to to the uh, to the Roman emperor of the German state. But it, it's it's uh, you, you quite often. I mean, in history of science, for instance, you read that Someone like Regio Montanus, for instance, was the first to really know in Europe to really know Greek astronomy again. 
poor Greeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But did, did they stop uh, speaking Greek or, or, I mean, poor astronomers in Greece, uh, they, that's, that's a slip of tongue that we all quite often read. And um, even our, for us medievalists, um, the, 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 the Greek, uh, the Greek part of Europe doesn't, doesn't really play a major role. And even if, if, even if we are aware of this, it happens to us that we write something like this. Um, yeah, this is, I, I don't think I will read this, the whole quotation, but it's interesting to look at Arab sources, Arabic sources, and how they describe this part of the world. They wouldn't use the term Europe because it's a Latin term, but here in Ibn Haukal, who is uh, um, uh, from um, Baghdad, um, you have uh, the small continent, Al Ard Al Sarira, um, because he, he believes that, or the small land, he believes that the Russian river system basically is connected to, to the surrounding ocean. And that's why there's the big land, which is Asia, and the small land, the small continent, uh, which is, he doesn't use the term Europe, but he just calls it the small. And he says it's Calabria, Galicia, France, and Andalus, basically, and parts of uh, um, Byzantium. So Arum, the Romans, as Byzantium is called, is divided, basically. That's interesting to see because, in a sense, what Arab geographers write about medieval Europe is more precise than what many what we have in popular accounts. So in, for Arab geographers, they would say, well, we have five different parts we have on this small continent. We have the part that is, um, we have the Latin part, and then the, the very north, very cold, nobody goes as too cold. Mm -hmm. And then the eastern part where lots of us travel because we can make, uh, lots of merchants are there. And we have settlements of Muslims, for instance, in Hungary, and uh, so we can travel from one congregation to the other. And then uh, we have Al-Andalus and, and Byzantine. So these five parts, um, but that's not Nouvelle's concept or Chateaubriand's concept. But for those who today want to defend, to get a bit political, Christian Europe, the medieval Christian Europe against, um, I don't know, invasions from so-called foreigners, they they basically have an, an historical, non-historical concept of Europe. If if they refer to medieval times, what they do. Um, okay, and yeah, this is the um, um, map from the West. I tried to have four, I, I wanted to have four maps in the book to have four different perspectives of Europe geographically. And um, one way to, but people could now say, okay, our our Europe, the medieval Europe that we like so much of the knights and the fortresses and chivalry and um, um, poetry and the troubadours and so on, which I invest most of my research time to into, and I, which I love. This is is I, I still call this um, I still call this Europe, and I just just ignore the rest. But um, it's not, and the rest basically like Andernus or Constantinople is, is marginal. It's marginal parts of Europe. But then, that's interesting. Um, but then what does marginal here means? It's really just a matter of perspective. If, if we think of the biggest cities, then Cordoba and Constantinople for many centuries were the biggest city, cities on European soil by far. So Cordoba in for many centuries, Cordoba, people like scholars like Hillenbrand would would estimate would have would have had uh, three hundred thousand. Now we have an echo here. No, it's gone. That's oh, gone. Very good. And 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 with Constantinople, we get to to about estimated five hundred thousand in the Middle Ages. But the twelfth century Rome or Paris would be thirty thousand. Perhaps we we can't tell exactly it's, it's a huge difference and um and 
from my perspective, I think many in many sources you can see that this was quite obvious to many middle Europe, middle Western European authors that the the big that there were big cultural centers on European soil outside Latin Latin Christianity. And I mean, in terms of alphabetism or rate or how many schools you have, how many libraries, there's such an enormous difference between a city like Cordoba or a city like Paris. Um, and yeah, so it's it's uh, the, the, these two cities, Cordoba and Constantinople, belong into the center of the European Middle Ages and not the margins. Okay, and if you look at the um, uh, current discussion of what Europe is about, we have here a quotation from Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. This encounter, i.e., the encounter of biblical faith and Greek philosophical thinking, to which is then added the heritage of Rome, created Europe and remains the basis of what can rightly be called Europe. You can see here this is basically Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome. This kind of concept, um, and this is the Regensburger Vorlesung. Perhaps the, 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 the Germans among us will remember this was really <laughs> infamous because there was a kind of scandal around it. Because some very a passage in the beginning about Islam that were very condescending, and. It started which, yeah, which was and it was in two thousand six to put the data. Right. right. Yes, basically, yeah, to to and it cost actually quite a bit of also written response in Middle East on Islamic study. Yeah. And I mean, it was a way to to use this polemics today, right? Um I, I, I would believe. Mm, but interestingly, if you read on in this Regensburger Vorlesung, it's it it's it, it, it's 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 uh, it's also um, strange because what he then says is that this combination of Greek philosophical thinking and biblical faith and Roman <laughs> heritage is endangered by three uh, waves of dehellenization, which is Reformation, Enlightenment and historical critical biblical <laughs> scholarship. And he says it's the reformers, uh, the Reformation, and he names the scholars of uh, the Reformation and then Enlightenment, he says it's Kant and historical critical biblical scholarship is Adolf von Harnack. So he mentions these people as basically the greatest dangers to Europe. And and Wellen des Enthellenisierungsgrams. I think th this is, you can see where this can lead to is basically a um, anti anti modern program. So to it's it's very very I mean to to go back to it's it's like the old dream yeah the old dream before to go back before French Revolution and Reformation um, he says of course he doesn't want to negate or the Aufklärung and um, Menschenrechte human rights and uh, female and emancipation and so on he doesn't say so but um, he, he he but it's it's very difficult to understand what what it could be, if if not reactionary, basically. Okay, now this I will do much shorter. Uh, what is typically European? If if I would ask you to sketch a panorama, panorama of European culture about thirty keywords, this would be difficult, of course, um, especially after I try to argue for <laughs> decolonizing and de-romanticizing. Uh, uh, concepts of Europe, but perhaps you answer this: Michelangelo, Mona Lisa, Rembrandt, Gothic, Classicism, Louvre, City Hall, equestrian monuments, Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Goethe, Tolstoy, Beethoven, Verdi, Chanson, Rome, Wittenberg, Geneva, Moscow, as it said, Rome, Istanbul, University, Coffee House, Pizza, Magna Carta, Tolerance. Anne Frank, Marie Curie, Simone de Beauvoir. Okay, this is very, I haven't, I mean, this I haven't invented. So this is the, 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 the chapter have headings from, uh, of, of a very um, 
a book that that is I commend reading. It's Europäische Erinnerungsorte. It's also in French, and of 2012, and it it tries to be inclusive to have there are women in there, one Russian. Uh, you have Moscow, and it doesn't doesn't try to to um, basically hijack antiquity. Um, but it's if you have a close look, it's 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 strange because it's all Middle Western European, really. If 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 you take away um, Tolstoy, basically, and um, and Moscow, and it's not even Spain appears. Um, I mean, we, we can be glad that that Shakespeare's in there. It's not not much, but neither. So it's very. But the Middle Western, um, yeah, the, the the Middle Western sound. Is extremely strong, Middle West and European sound, and I, 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 I mean that's my personal uh, um, sentiment, perhaps. But I, I can't really read this anymore, so I, I, I get nervous when I read things like this, and uh, I find it's, it's very, um, yeah, it doesn't, it, it's, it, it doesn't do justice to to so much um, cultural practices and. Um, uh, forms on this continent, and how could one do it differently? Um, one way I think to do to do it is to to look at to take the geographical concept as a, the standard concept, and to to look at a certain period of time and a certain practice, like this. This is uh, Ionian capitals around 300 AD. Now, um, this is not. I, I mean, I warn you, this is not not scholarly, not precise. I try just, this is, I try to roughly sketch where you would find in 380 Ionian capitals, Greek capitals. In Patna, India is, I think, the, the most eastern um, um, city where you find a Ionian capital, and then all the way up to the Atlantic coast. Um, but you could look at a different practice, like the sonata form you find in Haydn and Mozart around 1790. That's a dispute whether when it appears in London, um, you basically get Mannheim here and and Vienna and Hungary, and some northern Italian cities. Or then Sephardic prayer language, like Kunitzer described it around 1820, um, and then you get a different uh, map. So you, I mean, I wouldn't deny that you have cultural spaces. I, I think they do exist. So it's not, it's not um, arbitrary. Um, cultural forms um, can be detected by us historians, and you can can basically mark certain places where you have a certain cultural form um, practice at a certain time. And if you do it for a certain, if you do it for a certain time altogether, then you have a kind of net. Now this net of these three colors doesn't really work because as yeah my, my children find this is not yet convincing enough but i think mm -hmm. you can get the you get the I, I, idea of it and you can get a, a network of cultural practices and uh, for a certain time this of course doesn't work because it's 1820 and 300 and but you yeah but you can imagine how it would work for for one year and you can take away those net, nets that connect European soil with the other countries, um, uh, continents, Africa and East Asia. And then you can start to um, describe what, what is typically European in a certain uh, time. Um, and you can still use the concept, I think, sensibly. Um, and I think it's it's we need to use it because that's the way how we make sense of the past. We need such geographical concepts to to understand the past. But I I I find it as scholars much more sensible to use the geographical concept than any of the cultural concepts that we've been discussing today, uh, or even a political concept. Now, and if we do this. For instance, what 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 then happens is that we get other things into the picture, 
What if, for instance, if, just a very few examples. If you go to a library and ask for a book on 12th century European architecture, what would you get? You get the invention of Gothic, if people like to talk about inventions. And um, but if you if you talk about say, OK, I want to have something sacral architecture sacral like sacral sacral yeah, sacred, sacred. yeah and do you get something on the wooden churches in burgund and urnes in norway which are european heritage sorry heritage sites too uh, i mean yeah. enormous um monuments of um uh, architectural um geniuses and or do you get something on the synagogue in Erfurt another world heritage site the second phase or on the mosques in Granada being built in the 12th century or the church of Vladimir uh, the white uh, cathedral of Vladimir um, in Russia no it's it's a very what we get is gothic but gothic is a very regional phenomenon it's it what we as we are if we I mean the we is problematic, but Western Europeans like and see, but it's it's a very um, narrow um, concept of the history of architecture, sacral architecture. That's very appropriate if we are here yeah. talking about <laughs> churches. And then another if you another question if you go to to um, if you ask for a book on European architects of the 16th century, you famous architects, you get Michelangelo and Juan de Herrera on the St. Peter's Basilica and the Elos Corial. But do you also get something on Sinan Ben Abdelmenon, who had, who influenced uh, Eastern European architecture so much? I mean, he's the the famous. Does does any of you know Sinan? He's the the architect of the Sulaymaniyya. In uh, end of what we're saying, the which one? The Blue Mosque. Yes, absolutely. Yes, um, the Blue Mosque. I'm not sure, I but that, yeah, know. but there's Silmenia in in Edirne too, which is a fantastic building, as you can see here. So on on the in European Turkey in Adrianopolis. And the Drina Bridge, which is uh, famous too, and many caravanserais and hospitals in Sarajevo or in on the Crimea. Uh, so the architecture of, of uh, southeastern Europe is is um, is uh, influenced by Sinan for centuries, basically by by his style. Mm -hmm. So basically, Sinan and Michelangelo and Juan de and so on is 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 what is what we get if we look at influential architects of the 16th century. Um, yeah, what what you could also, or if you go to a lecture on 19th century uh, liberal theology, you, you liberal theology you could get the Catholic reform thinking, or um, yeah, liberal Protestant um, thinking in the 19th century. But do you also hear something about liberal Judaism? Abraham Geiger, for example, or on um, the uh, the current of Jadidism, the uh, of Jadid, uh, Jadidism is is um, part of uh, the Muslim liberal worldwide thinking in the late 19th century and was very influential in Russia, and a person like Sam, um, Gasprinsky um, was. Um, it's about educational reforms, about female education, about which languages to learn, about reading Avicenna together with Newton and these kind of things. So this is also liberal theology in the 19th century, European liberal theology. OK, these are these were three examples of how things could be done differently if if we look bottom up and understand it, European culture as as a network of um, that is often overlapping with North Africa and West Asia because there are so many um, connections. Okay, now a final word on multi-ethnic cities. Now Macron, this is a quotation from Emmanuel Macron, 
about what holds Europe together. The, the, what I described as a cultural network, is this enough for living together on the continent or in Europe? And some of you may probably say, well, it's not really enough to, 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 to bind us together. And Macron certainly would say um, no. Um, this, this quotation is from one of his uh, programmatic uh, discours on, on Europe. This Europe, where every European shock European recognizes his destiny in the profile of a Greek temple or in Mona Lisa's smile, where they can feel European emotions, the writings of Musil or Proust, this Europe of cafes described by Steiner, George Steiner, this Europe that Juarez called a law is very custom, this Europe of landscapes and folklore, this Europe of Erasmus, what holds it together is its culture. Now, by now in this talk, it, it doesn't really work, I hope, very well anymore with you. It's, 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 it's very Middle Western European and um, and to say that every European, Shak European, yeah, recognizes his or her destiny in a Greek temple, Mona Lisa. I mean, and and European emotions and Musil and Proust. I don't know. I mean, perhaps some of you <laughs> find Proust and Musil not emotional, but uh, <laughs> long winding or something. I don't. Know. It's 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 not. And and then the um, the cafes described by George Steiner. Where do we have this? No, I don't have the. Uh, but perhaps you've seen the the image I had of the Istanbul Cafe in the announcement of this lecture. Mm. So I, it's, I dropped out this picture. It's the cafe house. The coffee house doesn't is not a European invention. Um, and it's but it. And George Steiner says as long as the coffee house exists in the idea of Europe of 2004, the the idea of Europe will live on. But it's a very. I mean. It's, one of five pillars basically of the spirit of Europe, the coffee house. But the coffee house is so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is originated in, in on the Arabian Peninsula, then around 1500, then in Damascus and um, in Damascus and uh, Cairo. The first European city with a coffee house was Istanbul, 1555. And then you have Venice, 1660s, the first in, in, in Latin Christian Europe. So it's not it's very, it's, it's, yeah, it's not the, the to, to hang the, to hang the, uh, the idea of Europe on the coffee house is really strange. <laughs> and, yeah, and then I, in the end, I talk a little bit on, on multi-ethnic cities, because I think, uh, like Cordoban's Constantinople, that there's, uh, without idealizing them, because we had a lot, we have a lot of social tensions in there, but, Cities like Cordoba and Constantinople under Muslim rule, later in Istanbul, but also cities like Kiev or Bari um, are examples where you have a, they don't read, people don't really live together, but live in different quarters of a city. But you see many, many people of different colors, different languages, different customs, different clothing um, on, on, on the streets of like 11th century Kiev um, and they found 17,000 um, Arabic um, uh, dinars in in Kiev, in the area of Kiev. So it's, 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 it was very international. It was a merchant hub. Or the other example I have is, is for a smaller city like Bari. And there's a very nice study by Antonietta Maticanta on bridal gifts in medieval Bari of by some chance, we have the list of bridal gifts of 400 years, and it's a fantastic mixture of names of Latin, Greek, Germanic, Arabic, Slavic, Venetian, French names. Um, and you can see the 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 multi ethnic ethnicities, the multi ethnic <laughs> culture <laughs> yeah. of, of the city in like you have Circelli earrings and Zendai silk and something, these things. Um, now, for modern, I think for, yeah, I don't want to elaborate in this, on this, this is my final slide, uh, much longer, but I, I think the, um, what one can learn with this is that 
it's this is a middle way they had. You had a in these multi-ethnic medieval cities, you had a um, a, a certain um, legal system which gave security to the people living there. They they were not not always on the same level, but it was clear to them that somehow protected by a certain uh, situation, legal situation, and they they you wouldn't. If you were in Cordoba, you wouldn't marry across the borders between, say, a Christian or Muslim quarter, but you would um, live ne next to each other. And it's, it's like a middle way between um, assimilation and multiculturalism. It's, it's um, I think, um, a working community where people from basically... Uh, yeah the young people would meet, yeah, young people would meet across the borders of Muslim or Jews or Christians in Cordoba or the liberal elite uh, at, the, at, the, at the caliph's palace, you would have Jews and Christians on. Um, and yeah, the, the Halbwelt, how you call it in English, the, those who live in the gray zone of what is legal or illegal. Um, yeah. As it is today, basically, the yeah the liberal elite, the youth, and the the criminals don't really have a problem with ethnical or religious boundaries. Not not so much as as many others. So I think there's something to learn from from them that we don't need to have too much press, pressure either on right wing pressure on integration, assimilation, or left wing pressure on multiculturalism. I think there's a way to live together. Um, um, in 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 a way where they where you meet in certain places and have certain practice certain feasts so guess feast days like one of the most important christian christian festivals in cordoba was san juan um and we know that many muslims went to uh, the 23rd of june went to celebrate this together with christians because muslim authorities were not happy about this but then they were not successful because you have horse, uh, horse, um, how do you call it? Horse races. horse races, yeah, in on San Juan, and of course you would go as a Muslim <laughs> to 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 see the horse races, and uh, yeah, that's that's how I would like to end with the horse race today. Thank <laughs> you for your patience and your yeah listening to me.